Thank you uh, to the nice big turnout for our first uh, Dean's Research Seminar for the academic year and this term. Uh, so, so thanks for coming along. We're going to do some interesting research by me today on misinformation in financial markets. Um, and I don't want to take any more of this time. So thanks for doing this, and, and we're excited to hear about your work. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And obviously, taking time off your busy schedules to come, even in between teaching and and everything. So I'll try to make it interactive and interesting as much as I can. Uh, by the way, feel free to take some more food if you need to in between. I don't feel offended if you get up and <laughs> go out. So, um, so this is. Uh, so I thought it might be good, given that I'm fairly new. I'm new relatively a year now and I haven't met every one of you and we haven't or if we have met we haven't discussed in detail um, research and what I actually cover so I thought it might be good to give you an overview of of one area of research that I do and instead of going into detail into one paper I'll cover a couple of paper that are under the theme of information in financial markets or disclosure and I'll talk about this in in more detail um, but I think it might be uh, good if I tell you a little bit more about myself, how I came into doing research and accounting, and it essentially started off with this. Uh, so this is uh, Morphosis, it's a German biotech company, and uh, it IPO'd in 1999, in March, and if you remember what was going on in, in that time, uh, it was the tech bubble and everything was going up. So that was my first investment, and uh, I was in high school back then, last year of high school, and I thought it might be a good idea to get started investing my money. So um, I just essentially opened the newspaper, and first thing that, that um, was on the first page, actually, there was, there was a recommendation, um, IPO of Morphosis. I thought, oh, sounds good, name sounds good, what they do, I didn't really know, something with antibodies, but I didn't really understand what was going on, so I said, okay, I'll pick this. So it turns out, after uh, a couple of months, Essentially, I ate, uh, got eightfold of my money, and I thought, wow, this is fun. Um, I, I'm actually pretty good at this. <laughs> so, so I picked a few other firms, and um, as it happened, the party kind of stopped abruptly in March 2000, and, in March 2000, and everything went down. And um, by the time I got rid of this stock, I essentially was left with 10% of my initial investment. I thought, okay, maybe I'm not that good at it. So maybe it makes sense to actually look into what is going on in these firms and how to assess um, how these firms make money and how that translates into stock returns, into stock prices. So the second, um, uh, well, the second time I got even more interested in, in accounting was when I was sitting there on the trading floor at Lehman Brothers uh, in London, and it was 2008. And then it turned out to be September 15, 2008. And I was trying to understand what was going on and why suddenly the firm that I thought was, was a good um, place to start working, why it, went bankrupt, why it filed for bankruptcy. And um, essentially, at that point in time, uh, there was a whole discussion about how banks account for financial assets and there's this whole fair value accounting um, debate which I will discuss, uh, which I have essentially researched in some of my papers as well. But it was, if you had looked into, or if I had looked into the financial statements of Lehman Brothers before signing the contract, I would have seen that a 3% equity ratio might not be enough in a downturn to withstand losses. So there comes the whole discussion about uh, leverage. So. So these are essentially my, my research areas, and the whole Lehman experience uh, essentially made me become more interested into banking and accounting for banks, and I'll, um, but I'll focus today more on information disclosure. So essentially everything that companies disclose to the market in terms of voluntary or mandatory um, disclosure means. So voluntary, uh, mandatory meaning any regular reports that are mandated by either listing requirements or um, regulators, so the SEC, um, uh, the markets regulator here in the UK and so on, and voluntary essentially everything that the company provides in excess of what is mandated by, uh, by law. And in particular, I'm more interested in to, um, the choices that management makes, and I'll talk about this in more detail, in 
how they disclose information and what this information they disclose, and what economic effects those disclosures have on, on market behavior. Um, so essentially, if you think of, uh, of it in terms of in contrast to my finance colleagues who look at it from the market perspective, I predominantly look at it from the corporate perspective and the decisions they make. In the banking area, as I said, um, there was this whole discussion on on, um, that ba on banks having pro cyclical leverage, so essentially increasing their leverage, increasing their, their debt to equity ratio in boom times and then decreasing it massively in downturns, which essentially exacerbates um, boom and bust. And that one cause of this is essentially the accounting rules that incentivize them to do this and, and, uh, and specific the fair value accounting rules and then a series of papers are essentially um, uh, empirically try to understand whether this is the case or not, or what else essentially is driving this. And it turns out, as, at least as far as we find in a paper that is um, with colleagues at Stanford and UNC, is that it's more the regulatory requirements or the capital requirements that are based on essentially risk weights, so that are, that are risk weighted measure of assets that induces this type of behavior. And it's not really fair value accounting. And, um, uh, and there's a series of paper, papers that, are, that we are working on on this. A third area is essentially fairly new, is I'm also interested, given that I'm interested in information, it, not only it's financial information, but also non-financial information. So everything that companies disclose on sustainability or now they call it ESG, so environmental, social, and governance, and how A, that affects whether, well, whether this information is material, and material for investors, so do investors actually, are they interested in this information? If they are interested, how do they use this information? And does it have an effect on shareholder value? Or is it essentially information that is more of interest to other stakeholders that not necessarily are related to, um, uh, to shareholders? And there I've started my first uh, foray into uh, surveys. So it's a survey, I run a survey with investors and corporates and um, I'm working on, on that at the moment. But let's look into um, uh, the financial disclosures and uh, information disclosures um, in a bit more in detail. So, but before we do this, it's always good to provide some accounting wisdom. And uh, so this is the stock price chart of uh, AIG. And AIG, as you know, had uh, problems during the financial crisis as well, had to be bailed out with a, I think, 70 billion bailout by the US government. And in 2008, the the vice chairman came out and actually understood what accounting was about. And this is what he said. There are two sides on the balance sheet. The left side of the balance sheet has nothing right, and the right side has nothing left, but they're equal to each other. So accounting-wise, we are fine. <laughs> Meaning that they couldn't value the assets, and they had nothing left in equity on the, on the equity side, but at least accounting terms, they were okay. So that's lesson learned. Let me go into, um, into financial disclosure. So, and in particular, I have a serious, so this is all ongoing research. So there's, I'm still mostly work in progress, some early stage where we uh, are collecting data and doing first analysis, some in working paper stage, some submitted to journals, R&Rs, and so on. But it's not, not, none of this is published. Um, so, so I'm looking into essentially uh, mandatory reporting. And even if it's mandatory reporting, so let's say an annual report, management has some discretion in where to place certain information. So, and I'll show you essentially the structure of an annual report and where the discretion lies in there. And um, essentially I'm interested in whether the placement of information makes a difference of how inter information is interpreted and I'll discuss this in more detail. I'm also interested in information disclosure during certain events, so during big corporate events, and in particular, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Given that these are um, big investments for companies, and usually the information asymmetries between investors and management during that time are extremely large, and, uh, management has more incentives to disclose more information to essentially um, inform investors about, about these um, investments. And they can give earnings forecasts, and they hold investor conference calls about this M&A, and, and um, I'll discuss in more detail what we do in there. There's other events where insiders, so management, CEO, CFO, 
trade their own stock. So they buy or sell their own firm stock. And the question is whether there's information in this behavior in, in the buying and selling. Because you might um, think about uh, times when the CEO sells their own stock, what kind of signal it sends to the market about the belief of the CEO uh, about the future of this firm. Or whether it's just a liquidity event, the CEO needs to liquidate some of the stock because they're already heavily invested in the firm, so it makes sense for them to divest. But the problem here is, do investors understand, or can they distinguish between these two? And how is it actually possible? So is there some information um, in these insider trades, and particularly these sales? And then um, I'll talk a little bit about conference calls and how we use how information is provided to the market in these calls, and in particular, how CEOs behave during these calls, or what they say, and how, what, how um, analysts ask questions on these calls, and whether that uh, has an effect on the market behavior. Good, let's, um, let's discuss a little bit more kind of the framework that we are, that we are look, um, working in. So essentially, it's all about um, these information disclosures to the market, and if you, th if you believe in efficient markets, which says that all available information is instantaneously incorporated into stock prices, and you have rational actors and there's minimal extraction costs or information processing costs, then it doesn't actually matter where information is disclosed, as long as it is disclosed. So as long if information comes out, then it's immediately impounded into stock prices. So the efficient markets hypothesis actually doesn't distinguish the form in what form information is disclosed. It assumes that everyone has incentives to, um, to generate information because you generate um, trading profits that overweigh um, the costs of, of this, um, uncovering this information. And it is also assumed that market participants essentially see through kind of accounting choices that have fundamentally the same effect on, on the underlying performance of the firm. So whether, for example, a one accounting choice is um, so recognizing assets on the balance sheet or expensing it um, as, as an immediate expense, so let's say R&D costs, the firm has to expense the R&D costs immediately. Some other investments, so capital expenditure, are, are essentially recognized on the balance sheet as an asset and then um, depreciated, whether these two, so fundamentally, uh, the cash flow effects might, might um, be different, but essentially um, investors can see through these different types in drilling down what the cash flow effects are. So, so choices might not matter in, in that sense. But then we know from some work, some work over the years in behavioral economics and um, it was a work that Pedro does, and, and um, also in accounting, that there are costs of processing information. So, and these costs can be high enough to um, inhibit investors to uncover this information. So to essentially, um, to unravel this. So, so there's not a full unraveling of information. So some information might be left that is not impounded to stock prices, at least not immediately, uh, it takes time. Or even if, so, and this can happen even if investors are rational, so behave rationally. Or you can think of instances where investors are not rational, so they have some behavioral biases, so they might not pay enough attention to certain types of information. So there's a whole literature on limited attention that essentially shows that um, given the placement of certain information, so there's experimental evidence, even analysts only look at information that is more presented more saliently in, in reports and don't really look into information that is in footnotes, for example. And so, so there might be some behavioral biases that lead to information not immediately being um, impounded into stock prices. And also the, um, all these uh, well, theories on, on unraveling of information, so essentially that information is there's an incentive to disclose information and it's empowering to stock prices, it relies on this information being truthful. But there might be, essentially, investors might have, um, might interpret this information differently and might perceive the truthfulness of this information differently as well, which might essentially also lead to different <coughs> behavior. So this is essentially the, the framework that I'm, I'm working in. And in particular, I'm looking into what I would call strategic disclosure. So essentially, given that these processing costs exist or behavioral biases exist, uh, 
if you are a profit maximizing manager and you know this, then there might be instances where you could influence um, the interpretation of the information by choosing one way rather than the other way to disclose this information or by um, in a decision of to disclose versus to withhold information. So there might be differences in visibility of the information and mandatory disclosures or you have some discretion in the content, how you um, disclose more forward-looking information, more um, historic information, in what form, is it in the financial statements, is it in the footnotes, is it in the management discussion, is it a narrative, is it a number? And voluntary disclosure, essentially, do you disclose or not? Provided that, um, that the market expects that you have some information. And when do you disclose? So the timing of the disclosure. And then again, also the content and form. Good. So in one paper, we essentially look at the narratives of disclosure. And this quote kind of shows you where, on what level accountants stand in, in the view of the FT. <laughs> so, um, so what do we do in this project? So we take annual reports, and here is um, essentially Apple's uh, annual report. This, I think this is Daimler, the parent company of Mercedes. So you can see what we traditionally have used in accounting and also in finance mostly is essentially um, extract the financial numbers because uh, this quantitative information is available in databases, CompuStat, and so on, and this is usually what we have worked with. But there's a whole lot of other information in these annual reports, or 10K, as they call them in the U.S., um, which is more narrative. So there's a lot of text in there. And the question now is, is this narrative informative to investors? Do they actually read this information? Does it have some information content? Or do they actually just look at the four pages of financial statements plus maybe some supplementary information? So what do we do? Um, well, first of all, why is this important? Because um, also in the SEC and also the IFRS Foundation, um, they're essentially talking of breaking the boilerplate. So what the whole discussion in recent years is that these, these annual reports, and if you pick up um, BP's annual report, for example, that's 350 pages of, and there's four pages or five pages of financial statements. So the rest is, there's a lot of information, but often these are boilerplate disclosures. So they, they um, essentially have the same language, they don't change. Um, uh, they don't change and um, over time, and they might not even be informative, and they're becoming way too complex. And this is the whole discussion, whether the complexity can um, inhibit essentially the informativeness. And if you talk to investor relations um, people, they also say, well, actually, um, these are more compliance documents now. So there have become a lot of legal jargon has, is in there, but they used to be information documents to inform the markets. And for example, um, Shell, what they do is they obviously have to um, disclose their annual report and, uh, and filings, but what they also disclose is a summary to investors, which is a 50-page document. So apparently, from their perspective, investors don't want to read the annual report, they just want to read the summary, which is easier to digest. So then the question is, so what do we have the annual report for? In other work um, at the moment with the uh, United Nations Conference for Trade and Development, I've actually written a background paper on essentially this exact problem where they wanted to understand whether, inform, um, whether disclosures in their current form are useful to assessing risks of firms, especially if you are a long-term investor, so endowments and pension funds, and you hold these shares for so essentially long in, in, and passively long, whether you can assess um, risks in from, from disclosures and what inhibits essentially risk assessment. And I'm presenting this uh, at their meetings in two weeks. Uh, it will be a discussion. We'll see what, what comes out of it. Good. So what do we do? So we'll, we'll look at US firms um, and, and this because it's easier to extract this information um, because it's, compu uh, it's uh, essentially computer readable. And uh, the EU essentially mandates this now from 2020 onwards, I think, to have all annual reports and filings in essentially a computer readable form, but the SEC has done this for quite a while now, since 1994, at least in some form, there's, these reports are in text or HTML format, which makes it easier to essentially extract information from, also from the narratives. So this is, uh, I think, from Procter and Gamble, uh, the, the table of contents of this 10K, and what we do is, 
we essentially take the two most prominent narrative sections. So one is the management discussion and analysis, that's 24 pages, and the notes to the financial statement, which is are 28 pages. So you can see this is essentially most of where the narrative information is, is in there. And so the management discussion and analysis is essentially where, where management um, discusses the results which are in the financial statements so, and, and links them to the strategy, but also has some freedom to provide a little more information in terms of forward-looking information so they can say what they believe in the strategy is going to be in the future and, and, and so on. Yes, Pedro. Okay. On the note, what was the risk factors uh, section? Um, well, it was supposed to, this, so this was the latest addition, um, addition to essentially mandatory disclosures is that the SEC mandated risk factor, I think it was in 2002 or three, um, to um, disclose risk factors, so the principal risks that a company is exposed to. But if you look at, so this is just essentially a, a bullet point type um, kind of disclosure of risk factors. And if you look into this, it's essentially legal disclosure. So. The company says we are exposed to market risk, we are exposed to credit risk, we are exposed to. So it's very, there's very little variation in, in terms of how it's disclosed. But, um, but it, there's some, and, and some people have looked into specifically the risk factor disclosures. But good. So, so, and the, so the management discussion, more, there's, management has more dis, discretion what to disclose and how to disclose it. It's essentially just a narrative. And, and explain the numbers. The notes of the financial statements are essentially um, integral part to the financial statements and are also audited. So there's a little, little bit less discretion and there's specific rules um, that uh, in US GAAP what has to be in the notes and what you have to disclose and certain ways how you have to disclose it. Okay, so let me ask a question. So, so what do you think from on average from year to year how much of the narrative per in, a, in an average firm changes from year to year, let's say in the management discussion? So is it, let's say, 50% of the text changes, or 60, or any number, anyone? So how much new information is in there? Depends on if you get a new law firm or not. Let's say an average firm. 10%. 10, 20. 10 is actually not too bad. So. If you look at it, so we took um, 30,000 annual reports from 1994 to 2014. We took the management discussion and analysis, and then we measured how many words change from one year to the next in that management discussion. And it is, on average, in the management, 8% of the words change. It's essentially copy and paste plus a few differences. So then the question is, okay, but what's the point? Where's the information? So does it is there no information in there? What, what is happening? We also look into, uh, look into comparing each firm with firms in the same industry to understand how much firm-specific information is in these. So how much, and here's, essentially there's more. So, if, so there, it says, well, 55% is kind of common information. So they use the same words, um, discuss the same topics, but 45% at least is, is unique to, to the firm. Footnotes is even uh, less, yes? This is literally just words, not yes. content or statement or substance. Just, uh, uh, just, just comparing, so we, we tried, so this is essentially doing the following, and we tried different measures, yes. but we have to try a few more. So in this case, we, it's essentially a cosine similarity measure, which means what you do is you take the text of the MDNA, and then you count the words that appear, and each, um, each MDNA is, it becomes a vector, a vector of term frequencies of the word. And then you can compare this to, to the next. So it's essentially just comparing words, um, irrespective of um, where they are positioned in the sentence. Right? So, it, so, so essentially, if, for example, it's the same text, but the paragraph has changed, right? so the, the, the position of the sentence has changed, this doesn't take that into account, so it's still the same. Yeah, so, but, but this is what you see. So, because we, um, we 
we uh, calculate it relative to the amount of words that they say. So we would pick that up. And 1% change is already a lot right? in, terms of, um, in terms of overall. But, but so the other way to do this, so what we also do is you get rid of words that are essentially called stop words. So essentially they're gen generic words and um, currencies and all that stuff. So there's, there's a dictionary of stop words that you use to delete um, from this calculation to essentially just um, measure substantial words. But yeah, you're right. So even smaller changes we pick up right, in, in that sense. There's a different measure that we also try to use, which is called the Levenstein difference, which essentially takes, um, does the following. So it essentially calculates how many, um, uh, how many times you have to, or how many permutations you have to do to get from one um, paragraph or one sentence to exactly the same sentence. So how many steps do you have to take to get this sentence exactly to this sentence? So if you, is this exactly the same, there's zero steps. If maybe one word changes to one step and so on. So we use that measure as well and it's the same, it gives us a similar uh, measure. What we haven't done and what we need to do is essentially also um, go a little bit further and weight the words by the importance in the document. But we'll, we'll, I'll explain this a little bit in more detail. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, so there's what is called um, TF-IDF, which is the term frequency inverse document frequency. So what that does is, and this is what we still have to calculate, is we have all these documents, 30,000 annual reports. We can calculate what are common words in these, right? And, if, and then weight the words inversely by how common they are um, in all documents. And, then, and this gives you a weight, uh, a weight for the importance of this word. Yes. On the footnotes in particular, I mean, I mean, aren't the numbers more important than the words? I mean, I might expect to see the same table there year after year, but you know, the numbers are different. I mean, that's kind of important. <coughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so this is the question. So, are the numbers more important? So, so what we do is we extract all all the numbers and then essentially try to control for uh, for the change in the numbers, given, and then see whether the text still has it has um, explanatory power in, in, as I will show you, in um, stock returns or volatility of the stock. But the problem there is there's a lot of indigeneity, so we have to deal with um, unobserved factors that we have to control for as well. But we'll come back to this. Yes? Is there some way to benchmark if this is big or small relative to something else? So, for example, if I look at all referee reports that I submit across different papers, I don't know what my year or year reports report change in. Um, that's a good question. So, so we don't really make a statement about whether this is a lot of change or little. So this is just the average. And if you look at the distribution, there's actually a quite wide distribution. So the maximum, I think, was something around 70%. And the minimum is, I think, one or a half. So there's, so there's a wide variation in, in, in changes. I'm not sure what the benchmark what the benchmark good benchmark could be, but so, but we essentially, we try to also compare the two, so compare the management discussion and um, also with the footnotes. So this is just to give you some descriptives about um, what is going on here. So now, what do we do? Um, so actually, let me give you an example. So, and you're right, so, so this is the footnote of um, um, borrowings, corporate borrowings, this is AAR, uh, 1994 versus 1995. And essentially, it says at May 31st, 1994, same in 1995, blah, blah, blah. It's the same. It's exactly copy and paste the same, except for one sentence. And this sentence here is essentially commercial papers supported by all available domestic bank lines. And this doesn't appear anymore. And then the question is, what does this tell me about the financial, so the, the secureness of um, these commercial paper now in, in the next year? So, is, is there some, so our, the question that we ask, is there some information in these subtle changes in the text? So even more, or even starker is the MDNA, um, in this case, CellNet. So CellNet is an um, information provider. They, um, they did some wireless networks. And here it said in, I think this was 1997, 
the company will not typically invest in up capital necessary to deploy a wireless communication network prior to entering into long-term service agreements. So they enter into service agreements first and then deploy uh, the capital. In the next year, they say the company will be required to invest significant amounts of capital in its networks and, and incur substantial increasing sales and marketing expenses before receiving return on such expenditures through networks. So, so that's a big difference. Right? So, so one, they say they not they don't invest any capital before they receive they, before they have these contracts. And the other next year, they say they have to invest. And they also say uh, further down that they don't do any research anymore. So that sentence has essentially evaporated. So the question then is. Do these subtle changes tell us anything about um, what is going on in the firm? And this is one firm, so on average. So in this case, this is from the filing date of the 10K up to, um, what is it, a year later, I think, uh, a little bit more than a year, and the stock has lost uh, roughly 80% compared to uh, the S&P 500. So the question is, so this is a sample of one, but we want to see on average, is there some information content in these changes, in the words, and in some other measures. So what do we do? So essentially, we, we um, try to see, one is, um, does the length of the narrative matter when com um, holding, essentially, the information that is in the numbers constant? Sorry. Yes. So you're saying that, uh, let me go back to the question about the uh, that basically the default is that you would like to change essentially nothing. Yes. Except if something causes them to change yeah. something. Yeah. That's pretty much. So, so also say is it the reverse? If something good happens, is that what you're saying? And that's, so, so I'll, I'll come back to this. So essentially, that's a good, so the, the issue that, or the explanation that we have here is, so there's a path of least resistance. So, so you don't want to change um, anything in the report unless something has happened. Now the question is why is it, or is it asymmetric? So is the change always negative? Or could it also be positive, right? And it turns out that it's actually, on average, is associated with negative news. So change is always with negative. So, but then where's the positive news? So why isn't the positive news disclosed anywhere? And um, what we think is it has to do with the timing of the filings. So if you think about when these, these um, 10Ks are filed, so when they come out, it's usually, so they have to be filed within 90 days, and for some larger firms, I think it's earlier than that, uh, 75 days. But then this is for full-year results. But then an earnings announcement for the full-year results is usually much earlier than that on average. And given that, so there's evidence out there that there's a tendency of management to withhold or delay um, negative news. So what do you do in the earnings announcement? If you have positive, you want to get it out, right? So all the positive news is coming out in the earnings announcement. And the negative news is more slightly buried somewhere in, in the text. We haven't, so this is our conjecture. This is mandatory stuff. So, so what, what the link fails is between the good, between yeah. good changes and the yeah. Changes. And that's, uh, this is what we have. This is essentially what we came across now. And we have to test whether our hypothesis is, is right. So we have to see whether those firms that have good news announcement during the earnings announcement, whether there's um, changes in the MDNA and text as well, so that, or whether it's only there's essentially a correlation with um, negative changes. Yes? Have you, have you talked to analysts to see if this stuff is just sort of trailing indicators of what's already sort of priced in or information that people already have? And so it's something that's happened previously, and this is this looks like it's just sort of um, rhetoric. And yeah. It's stuff that they have to disclose and talk about, but then I'm guessing that people sort of that are in the know in terms of they are analysts who study these, you know, this stuff. So, and that's the question, and um, we haven't talked to analysts, well, we have talked to some investors, and essentially the more serious investors, they read it, they read the MDNA, there's a very important section for them, 
Um, but what we have done is, if you look at, so we essentially look at on average what's happened. So if analysts, so if this information is already out there, right, then it would have to be impounded into stock prices. So filing the return should not move stock returns. Right? Right. So that's what we're trying to tease out. Exactly, that's what we're trying to tease out. And it turns out the filing returns, um, there's a correlation, association between these changes and the filing returns, a negative one. So, so, so the market reacts to these in the short term, but then seems to not fully react to it because there's also an association with long-term negative news. So they still, there's still some, and again, it comes back to either extraction costs because not everyone is reading this and it's buried somewhere and it's very subtle changes or behavioral biases that there's limited attention to this, right? So, um, so and, uh, but we do a, li a little bit more. So given that we have the text and we can measure some more textual characteristics. So one is the length, but so often um, in the literature early on they have used the length as a proxy for complexity. So the more words there are, the more complex it is. I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good uh, measure, but we just use it as a measure of information content. So the more they talk, the more there is, the more likely it is that there is information in there. So that, um, is it essentially, and we find that the length is associated with um, volatility, share price volatility, so there's some news coming out, and more so with the MDNA, which is more prominent versus the footnotes. But then the footnotes, as, as you said, there, there's more reaction to the numbers so the numbers matter more because there's more tables, it's more uh, formatted. But what we also do is we look at the sentiment of these sections. And with sentiment, so we measure the tone in these sections. So we measure how positive or negative is the discussion in the MDNA and um, the discussion in, in the footnotes. And now the difference in terms of what is required by, um, for, by law or by um, the accounting rules so footnotes are audited, right? And you have to disclose certain material <coughs> risks. So let's say there's a footnote on contingent liabilities. So liabilities that might, um, might occur in the future because of some, let's say litigation or, or some, um, some other event. So you have to disclose this. So, so, that, so the tone in the footnotes might be negative because there's some risk coming out. Now in, in DNA, management has more discretion. So they can choose how they um, describe the firm. So we want to see whether the discrepancy between the tone and the MDNA compared to the footnotes, whether that explains whether there's some strategic disclosure behavior. So whether, for example, even if, let's say, there's a lot of negative news and they have to disclose it, it's in the footnotes, so the footnotes are extremely negative, whether then the MDNA is also negative because they're essentially mirroring this and they're summarizing what is going on, or whether the MDNA is positive. And if it is positive and there's a discrepancy between the two, does it explain something? Does it tell us something about whether they're trying to influence um, the risk? So, and what we find is essentially, there's this discrepancy is associated with negative future performance, accounting and stock price performance, especially for those firms that have, um, um, uh, uh, announce negative results. So, f and firms that ha are essentially in the bottom quintile uh, deciles of accounting performance. So firms that perform badly, this discrepancy essentially explains um, that they further are going to perform badly. So essentially it shows that management is trying to, to portray the results or essentially um, present the results more positively in the MDNA, which is more, um, more prominent but has to essentially um, disclose the negative information in the footnotes. Again, these are so far associations, right? So we have to be a bit more careful about, um, about teasing out these, uh, these links. Yes? Um, how do you get tone? So tone, we, again, there's different ways of measuring it. Um, the easiest way is essentially you just count, so you have a dictionary of what is considered positive words and what is considered negative words, and then you, um, you essentially count the amount of positive words to total words minus the amount of negative words to total words, and that net is the net tone. So the LIC? Uh, which, which particular? Dictionary. Um, they, have, they have some linguistic, computational linguistics. So there's LIWC is like 
um, from computational linguistics. There are certain dictionaries. Um, but then there's also, so in this case, um, there's previous uh, research uh, in, in the Journal of Finance, so Ruff, Loughran and McDonald have done some measurement of tone. And essentially what they argue is using normal dictionaries, so uh, common language dictionaries, some words that are associated with negative tone are not necessarily negative in financial language. So take liabilities. So in common language, liability has a negative um, connotation, but in finance, it's not necessarily negative. So they then devise a, a dictionary of financial positive and negative tone, and that's what we essentially use. So, but again, it's just counting words so, so far. Yes? That's actually a good idea. So that's, um, there might be something in there. So because, so your argument is if they, they essentially, they have to show gap earnings. So the earnings that are mandated by accounting rules, but they can also then show another earnings number where they say, well, but for our business, we strip out goodwill impairment, we strip out amortization and so on. And generally there's the, the non-gap number is more positive than the gap number. And whether there's a um, link, uh, we could we should actually do that. Just another way for management to convey yes. what they believe is happening relative yes. to what the accounting standards requirement disclose. Yeah, that's true, and that's actually a good idea. What we do is um, we see whether there's an association with the discrepancy and um, earnings management uh, measures. So whether they're more likely to also manage earnings when they're trying to um, portray. Uh, provide more positive information. Yes? How big is an <laughs> Well, I mean, we don't want to go that far. So, so the question is... <laughs> that's true. Uh, I would rather trade on this than sue someone. But, yeah. But, uh, so, so the... The issue here is that, and this is probably why that it's more positive in the MDNA, is because the MDNA there are um, safe harbor provisions, so management can essentially provide forward-looking information with, in, in a more safe way than um, that they could in the audited uh, part, right? So they have a little more discretion without being sued, essentially. So. Good. Um, so. So, so this is how far we get. There's a lot we have to do. Yes, Peter. Right. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so essentially, if you look at the, so the biggest effect comes from the sentiment dis discrepancy and from the um, changes to the MDNA. And essentially, th there's a, it's roughly 50 basis point in terms of announcement returns, more negative. So the association, so the coefficient is essentially roughly an increase in, in a one standard deviation in the change of the MDNA results in 50 basis points more negative announcement return. But in terms of uh, an annualized return, so, so if you form portfolios based on it, it's roughly uh, around 19, 18, 19 percent. And that's controlling for the common factors. So it's huge. on changes in the MDNA. Yeah. And you go along the ones that are, have little change and you short the ones that have a lot of change. On the filing date. On the file, yeah. And then hold them for one year. Then it's a rough 19%. Uh, yes, it's a lot. Not taking into account transaction costs and so on and turnover. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe they don't, they don't get it. Yeah. So maybe they're just yeah misleading. Yeah. And that's so 
And this is what we're trying to tease out. So at the moment, um, uh, so what we have to do is use some more sophisticated textual measures. So I ex explained TF-IDF, maybe even some more advanced uh, natural language processing techniques. So essentially see whether um, the syntax, so whether it is actually misleading and whether we can from computational linguistics find um, some, inf well, some information that tells us what syntax is deemed as misleading or what type of words might be deemed as misleading. And then um, also um, check out this news flow with earnings announcement, right? So whether it is in fact the case that positive news is pre-announced or announced in the earnings announcement and all the negative news is buried in the, in the 10 case to tease out this impression, what we call impression management that they're trying to do. So that's, that's one. So essentially that's um, the work as you see, it's moving into this um, textual analysis direction um, um, for the annual reports. Any question on this? Yes. So the thing is a question. Yeah. Uh, how much of uh, this is the latest rate zone? Is it just one? Yeah. Oh, how much is just, just yeah. the tone? Yeah, so essentially individually, so the tone in the MDNA and the footnotes has a v almost zero effect. So, um, so we, we run essentially the thing individually, so just look at the tone in the MDNA or the tone in the footnotes. And there's some association depending on, on how you specify the regressions, but it's not really that um, you know, pronounced. The discrepancy essentially explains it. And, and the discrepancy is essentially only important for those that underperform for those firms. So for those that, that for the top performers, it, there's... Uh, underperform means, means actually the tone in the uh, footnotes must be particularly negative. Negative, yeah. Um, yeah, that could be. We can, we can actually have a look at that. Yeah. Should be, right? Yes. It's like 40 basis points, yeah. But when you look at your ahead, it's a huge effect. Yes. Almost unheard of impact. Yeah. And so the question is, does that year-long impact come from negative surprises on, on future earnings announcements or future shocks? Or does it come from some kind of uh, trending that people are uh, uh, understanding the information? That we have to check, right? So, so there's something. So whether it's uh, associated with some more negative news that comes out, right? So whether it's it's negative earnings surprises or analyst downgrades or whatever it could be. So that yeah, that's something we need to check. I think we haven't done that yet because it, it is it is a bit too big of an effect to, for my taste so far, right? So it's it's it doesn't really make sense from if you read like I mean you know from the finance you know, it's just too big, right? So we have to see what what's happening there. Yes. Well, which well, yeah. you said it's only Portuguese news. Right? Yeah, but but one day Portuguese yeah, news. Yeah, it's it's, it's big, big, yeah. That's huge. Which, which might the which might explain why I received a couple of calls from some funds when I put this on SSRN, and they were interested in. Well, they were interested in. So there's a lot of funds that do this type of stuff, and coincidentally, there's another paper out there, another working paper. Well, unfortunately, I would say. Uh, um, uh, Lauren Cohen at HBS has, has essentially, he just focuses what they do, they just focus on the changes and then, and they find essentially very similar. I think he, they even find 22% annualized return, so. Which essentially goes back to the question, why is this the case, right? So we want to uncover what is it? Is it impression management? Is it some predictor of negative news somehow? So what is, what is the what is leading us to this? Um, why is it only asymmetric? Why is it only the negative information? So, but, and the volatility continues throughout. It's not just on length, but the increased volatility has stopped prices and returns. Yes. For the other measures. Uh, yes, for some of them. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, so, short term, yes. There's some. Um, they also are associated with long term volatility. Okay. So, there's a higher uncertainty apparently around interpreting. Um, let me uh, tell you something about the other project that we're doing. Essentially, 
um, again also on filing disclosures. And um, so here it's on insider sales. So, so what, is the, what is the issue with insider sales? So the question is, do insider sales contain information value? And here there's these two. Uh, so one is from Forbes that says not all insider trading is created equal. So someone essentially gave a comment and had so far recommended American Realty Capital properties because um, insiders have bought the shares and given that they buy the shares, so they accumulate their exposure to their own firm. It's supposedly good news, so they recommended this firm. But then suddenly these insiders started to sell um, disposed 20,000 shares. And then so now this commentator says, ooh, should I reverse my recommendation that this was a good buy? Because now they're selling. But then says, wait a second, um, not all insider trades are created equal. And um, it's very easy to look at the wrong kind of trade and draw wrong conclusions. And I come back to this in a second, what the problem was here. In this case here, it turns out that um, the CEO and I think CFO and uh, someone else, so three people traded on um, Body Central stock and in May 1st, May 2nd, and May 3rd and disposed of a lot of shares. And then after the trading, after closing of the market on May 3rd, the firm came out and had negative, um, as I should, announced negative earnings or an earnings miss. And the shares dropped 20%. And well, the, the uh, executives came out and said, well, we didn't know this because these trades were already um, pre-announced pre or pre-set six months in advance. So, so this was an automated trade. It just happened to be that it was just before the earnings announcement. So is this, is, was this luck or was this information? So, so, and this is essentially what we're trying to understand. So how can investors understand whether these, these um, insider sales are informative or whether they're just either automated trades and, or liquidity trades for some liquidity reason and there's no information content in them. Because on average, you might think that if you pull the two, do we find an effect or not and can we dis um, dissect or dissect these two? In the case of this company, so the insider sales here were essentially because these executives were mandated by the SEC to sell their shares and forfeit, forfeit the um, amount because there was some accounting scandal. So, they had, so there was no information content in terms of bad news. So the bad news was already out there, the accounting scandal. And here they were just essentially forced to sell the shares. So we gotta, you have to know the reasons why they sell the shares. And this is essentially what we do because it turns out that on these SEC filings, the Form 4, not only is it, does it say how many shares they buy or sell, at what price, but there's also a footnote. Not always, but often. And in this footnote, it sometimes says, says why they sell. So it's, it states the reason of the sale. And we essentially extract these footnotes from these SEC filings and try to understand whether there's information content in these footnotes. So what do we do? Um, essentially, we take two million insider trade filings, so essentially all we could find online from the SEC, extract where there was a footnote, extract um, the footnotes, essentially also note whether there was a footnote or not because that's also, that might also be informative, and, and then try to understand the reasons that they state in these footnotes. So first we have to think about these footnotes are voluntary. So the SEC um, filing is mandatory, right? So they have to file, but these footnotes are voluntary. So then the question is, so they, they, is there might be some information content in the decision to disclose a footnote versus not, right? So this might be explained by the costs and benefits of um, whether to disclose a footnote or not. So, um, and then when they disclose a footnote, understand whether this describes a discretion, what we call discretionary sale. So it's for discretionary reasons or non-discretionary, they had to sell or there was some other, there was an automated sale or it was covering taxes or something else. So we extract these footnotes and um, look at the text and try to classify the text into discretionary versus non-discretionary. Yes? So where are the percentages in terms of disclosure? Um, the percentages is, so there's, uh, I think it's 30, 70 roughly. So uh, um, 30, 70 in terms of, Oh no, 60-40 probably, like 
no disclosure 40 disclosure, and then most of them are um, non-discretionary, and then there's discretionary ones. Are there systematic like person, firm, or industry effects in terms of rats, or can you filter quite a little? Um, we haven't specifically looked. We we essentially use a firm uh, and. I think also CEO fixed effects in, in regards to we control for that. We haven't looked into whether they're systematic, but we, we should, because there might be. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, I think there are, because some CEOs are more forthcoming and some uh, are less. So what do these footnotes say? So essentially, you can see in these, oh yeah. In the, in the timing of the, the notes and the Well, there's definitely information in the timing of the sales. So that the other papers have found that. But, but the but question is whether, whether there's if you interact that with raw data, you should actually find extra effects. Yeah. So, um, we haven't done that, so but it's a good idea. We could we could tease that out. That's actually true. So there might there might be some so there might be some CO effects, there might be some timing effects that we can actually look into that's a good idea. So what do these say? So under discretionary footnotes, we essentially put everything where the selling um, executive has discretion over timing or the amount of the sale. So and often it says, well, it's a gift for um, children, it's a, for liquidity, just very generic. It's a retirement planning. It's in behalf of the family options exercise and. Um, or divorce settlements, it's tuition for the kids. So there's liquidity needs of the CEO, or it's what they call 10B5-1 trades, which is essentially pre-planned trades. So the CEO has um, essentially to avoid being um, subject to, or uh, being mistakenly seen as trading on inside information, they can say, we will essentially trade next year in September, September 22nd or whenever, and um, so these are pre, pre-planned trades. The problem with these pre-planned trades are, and this is why we put them as discretionary footnotes, is that this, the executive can still elect to cancel the trade if, on the last day. So if it doesn't make sense to trade, then they will cancel. There is some information content in there, and some previous um, papers have shown that there is information content in there. And the non-discretionary, it's essentially, it's for taxes, so they, they exercise their restricted stock options, um, say stock options, or they um, have some other gains that they realize they have to cover taxes, and for those taxes, they will sell shares to cover the taxes. There's some errors in trades, sometimes that happens. There's automated trades, other than the 10B5 ones, where the company has um, essentially the control over the trade. And those, there's no discretion for management, yes? Yeah, it could. So we. Yeah, so it could be. So, but we. So we tried. Either way, it doesn't really make a big difference. There's not that many, but um, we just say, well, if um, you can essentially elect, yeah, should I cover the tax with cash? But it's usually when when they exercise stock options and then the for the sale of the shares, that portion they essentially sell more shares to cover part of the tax, but. So what do we find? Um, what we find is that if it's a discretionary trade, then there is a more negative reaction than for non-discretionary controlling for a host of other factors. And these, non, these discretionary trades essentially have a pre, um, have negative future stock returns on, and are associated with Analyst, future analyst downgrades, earnings misses, so negative earnings surprises, and a negative news, for example, uh, like litigation so initiations. So there seems to be, in these discretionary trades, there seems to be some information content compared to the non-discretionary ones. So in terms of that they, um, that there's some negative news. So they're trading, seemingly they're trading on negative, uh, on, on news. And again, so, we say this is, again, um, consistent with strategic disclosure because 
what do they do? So in these footnotes, they uh, essentially show, uh, they try to explain the sales as liquidity sales. So they say it's tuition for the kids or it's divorce settlement, but there's still information content in there. So in terms, uh, and essentially given that the market can't distinguish otherwise between liquidity sales and, um, and uh, information-based sales, we say, so this, if you actually read the, foot, if you read the footnotes, it's not enough. You also have to understand whether it's still discretionary or non-discretionary. We use the footnotes as a measure of measuring this. Yes? problem with non so this is, comes back to um, the incentive to disclose so if if you don't disclose it's essentially considered as there's uh, it's an information based trade because there's non disclosure so everyone has an incentive to disclose and say this is a non information based trade and given that there is this incentives you then uh, they try to uh, manage that using um, the words in there to explain it as a non because it's essentially this unraveling um, argument right, that there's always an incentive to disclose because some firms disclose, some do not. And to dis distinguish yourself from those that essentially trade on information, you have to disclose. If not, the market rationally infers that you are a, um, it's bad news. And we find this, right? So, so the, um, there's no distinction between the market reaction of the discretionary disclosures and non-disclosure. It's the same. Right? The, the difference. There's no difference. No. Whether you explain it, uh, right? So, no, whether you have a footnote or not. Yeah. So having a footnote is, um, was, it, on average, is better than not having a footnote. Oh, it is. Yeah. Oh. But, it, but the, the discrepancy comes from the non-discretionary trade. So the discretionary, if you have a discretionary footnote, there's no difference. Okay. So, so the market reacts to, so they, they understand, they still are skeptics, so they understand on filing, right, that these are negative news events, but not fully because they still correlated, associated with future negative information. So there's some underreaction to the information content in, in these. Yes? So, sorry, so you're saying having a discretionary footnote shows the same effect as not disclosing anything at all? Yeah, well, it's, in this, yeah. it's, it's less, but it's indistinguishable statistically from. Then why would you disclose? Well, the question is uh, whether, so if they say they have to, and we haven't looked into this, but I doubt that they would lie and say um, we sell for tuition for the kids, right, and then to pay for the tuition, um, given that it's an SEC filing, right? So, but then you can still time the trade, right? So they're coming back, so maybe there is, so there might still be some information, even though you say, so it might be liquidity, there might be a liquidity reason why you sell, but you also sell at an opportune time when you know there's um, negative news to come or um, just after positive news. So I mean, we need to tease that out more, but good. Any more questions? So again, um, strategic disclosure. So that's so far. The last one I want to discuss before we finish off is on particular events, and in this case, merger announcement. Here, uh, if, so there's a lot of optimism around mergers, and in this case, this was AOL Time Warner merger, and um, Mr. Turner, who had a big stake in, in Time Warner, and AOL was buying it, since he came out with this comment. Uh, I'm not sure what that says about his love life, but um, there we go. <laughs> so. So what we try to understand is, at these merger announcements, what information comes out. Right? So, and in particular, again, going back to voluntary disclosure, why do some managers of the acquiring firm, why they disclose um, synergy forecasts or earnings forecasts for the combined firm, and why do some don't disclose anything? Right? So why is there variation in disclosure behavior, and what is the economic effect of disclosing? So, um, so what do we do? So, we look into um, the conference call transcripts. 
add merger announcements. And we'll extract, um, in one project, we'll ex only extract the earnings forecast that management makes for the combined firm. So what, what happens is they come out and they say, um, taking over target XYZ will increase our earning, combined earnings um, by X amount, by X percentage. Usually on an um, earnings per share basis. So they say, um, essentially the market expects, so if you talk to analysts, Everyone expects mergers to be accretive, so to add to earnings. And they use earnings per share because there you can essentially take into account that these large acquisitions, they have share issuances, and these share issuances will dilute essentially the overall earnings. So essentially they take earnings per share as a summary measure of whether this is a good merger or not. Whether, it's a good, whether this is a good measure is a different question. So we look at these earnings um, announcements for acquisitions between 1990 and 2013, and then in a separate one, we actually look at the conference call transcripts, but that's still a um, work in progress. So what, what would this look like? So here, essentially, um, there was a lot of skepticism about HP's acquisition of autonomy in um, 2011. And here he comes out, the CEO, and says, just to make sure everybody understands, autonomy will be on day one accretive to HP, meaning adding to the earnings of HP. Just take it from us. We paid a very fair price for autonomy, and we'll give a great return for our share, to our shareholders. That's in 2011. A year later, unfortunately, as you know, there's a 8.8 .8 billion um, impairment charge on this acquisition. Didn't really work out that well. So then, they, so what we try to understand is, so are these forecasts too optimistic? And, um, and what effect do these forecasts have on shareholder behavior, right? So do they actually react? So everyone might think, well, it's obvious that there's a lot of optimism. So, so rationally, you would discount um, whatever management projects and earnings uh, to some uh, more sensible figure. In this case, there was a little bit more complication because autonomy kind of, um, uh, I wouldn't say cooked the book, but uh, essentially it had some aggressive accounting to portray the firm in a better light. So that's, you might feel for HP in this case. So what are we trying to measure? So we are trying to measure earnings forecast, the effect of earnings forecast on merger outcomes. So does this have an effect on how, in particular in share for share mergers, when there's a share exchange, um, how target shareholders vote, so do they vote in favor of a merger if they are getting information from management that says the earnings are going to be great? And um, do they, is there uh, a resolution of uncertainty faster, meaning that the merger negotiations complete faster, so time to completion? And um, some other measures in terms of the price being paid, so everything else equal, would you, in a share for share merger, accept a lower premium given that you are promised a future um, higher synergies and given that you have a share of higher synergies, um, you would accept maybe um, on average um, a lower immediate premium. Problem here is though, as we have in a lot of accounting research, is the indigeneity. So the problem that there's some unobserved heterogeneity, so unobserved factors that might affect the, the incentives to disclose these earnings, but also have an effect on merger outcomes. So what we need to do is essentially to find some variable, some instrument that is unrelated to these unobserved factors and unrelated to merger <coughs> outcomes, but is strongly correlated with forecasting behavior. And through this, then we can essentially at least find some, I wouldn't say co strong causal link, but at least better causal link between forecasting and merger outcomes, and not only associations. So what we do is um, we look at the forecasting or disclosure behavior of these managers before the, um, before the merger announcement, so in the three years before, and we just essentially say, well, and this is coming back to uh, what are, who are these managers? Are they more forthcoming? So if these managers give quarterly guidance, meaning they're more forthcoming with the, with the market, they might also be more inclined to provide forecasts in a merger context. Now, the incentives are slightly different, as we will see. But so, and so we use essentially the prior um, forecasting behavior as, as an instrument. Problem here is, as the referee has painfully made us uh, aware in three rounds and still not convinced, is that the prior forecasting behavior might still be um, 
associated with merger outcomes if it's associated with just general management quality. So maybe these are good managers and good managers inform the market more and because they're good managers, they also make better acquisitions. What we are showing that they're actually not making any better acquisitions at all. These are acquisitions that are pretty bad, but, but so we do something else. So we look at the disclosure behavior of the peers of the firm. So if there are other firms that disclose previously, does this put pressure, so does the market then put pressure on this firm to also be more forthcoming and use the peer disclosure, peer firm disclosure behavior as an instrument? Still not perfect, but uh, it's difficult to find instruments. So what do we find? So we find that um, when you disclose earnings forecasts, and irrespective of whether it's a number, so they, they can provide numbers or point forecasts or just a range, or even just say it's accretive as in the HP case, there's a 40% high, higher um, um, likelihood of completion, and there's a 46% uh, reduction in time to complete. So these are more likely to, to complete, and uh, they complete faster, and there's a 10% lower premium. But problem is, so there's benefits and costs of disclosure, and you have to weigh these benefits and costs. If you disclose, especially if you disclose a number, you then later on become... Um, well, shareholders can say, well, you disclose this number, earnings are going to be X, but you only provide it Y, so what's going on? We also find that there's cost to disclosing and there's a higher likelihood of litigation and a 20% higher likelihood of CO departure after uh, merger. And this is particularly for those that underperform um, because shareholders are not happy about um, the forecast. So you, you're exposing yourself to, to, um, to this litigation which is which is actually explains the separating um, equilibrium of. Um, is this all just window dressing? Because we know that acquisitions don't create value, right? Yeah. On average, like across, in terms of acquirers, yeah. for the most part, they don't create what value. So if you have completion as a dependent variable, you actually don't want that in terms of you want shareholders or stakeholders to put a check on on the exuberance around how much positive value we're going to create out of this move. Yeah. So that would be a good thing if the merger didn't happen. Does that, is that the right way to interpret it? Or no? you, well, yeah, you could interpret it in, in the sense... So Deutsche Bank is happy. Of course, their incentive is to say, this is fantastic, yeah. merger and acquisition, and so forth. But they have, their incentives are to say that. Uh, and, but we know for the most part that these don't create that. Yeah, so the problem here is, uh, the question we ask is, why do shareholders believe these forecasts, right? If, because they turn out not to be, and we compare for those that we, and I'll show you some more um, data for those that we have point forecasts, we can compare what the outcome was and it doesn't, it's, very, it's too optimistic, right? And um, so, and that's the question. So, and this is where also the referees have a problem. They say, well, shareholders are not that stupid, right? Especially not over time from 1990 to 2013, you learn. Well, we looked at repeated acquirers. There's no learning going on. A little bit, but not economically not significant. But what we do is essentially we say, okay, what would, how would shareholders be able to assess the credibility of these forecasts ex ante, right? So what we do is then we look, okay, maybe it's, it is a CEO effect, right? So let's look at the credibility of the CEO before the merger. So we measure essentially the bias, um, consistency and accuracy of earnings guidance that these CEOs give in the years before the merger. And then you can, so if they are more accurate and less biased and more consistent in their forecasts, we essentially create it, say they are credible. And if they've always been too optimistic and there's a lot of variation, then they're not that credible. And it turns actually out, so if you um, split the sample into credible and non-credible, Essentially, the benefits of forecasting, so the completion likelihood is much, much higher for, for those that are credible than those that are not. And the costs are all borne by those that are not credible. So the market does distinguish between the two yeah, to some extent. And they should because if you look at the post-acquisition performance stock returns, there's this monotonic relationship with those that provide. So this is measured as the first, first full year post-acquisition, so from completion to first full year, those that provide forecasts that are not credible, minus 6%, those that provide forecasts that are credible, still not great, but better at least, no forecast, still not great, and then those that 
announce the acquisition but don't complete it because they can't get the shareholders to um, agree on it, they fare the best. So there's this, which is a pretty bleak picture, to be <laughs> honest. Good. And so this is for, sorry, Pedro. Yeah. I guess maybe the next picture. Yeah. I mean, is this negative average number a combination of good and bad, or is this bad? Uh, no, this, this, so this is the average, right? So there might be some. Right, so, so, so is there a way to disentangle the, the ones that are like good? versus the ones that are bad. So in this case, we only look at whether they provide forecasts or not. So essentially, irrespective of whether it's a number or, or um, they just say it's going to be accretive. We then look specifically at the numbers and then say, well, let's take just the numbers and let's say those that um, forecast EPS to be accretive by more than 10% is aggressive. That's too optimistic. And the rest is conservative. And then form portfolios, and this is what comes out. So, there's, so in terms of those that are more aggressive, you have over the 24 months after um, the completion, it's like a minus 15% um, return versus the other ones fairly flat. So again, there seems to be some um, over. So, and now the question is, is this optimism? So genuine optimism of the CEOs? Or is it, again, might there be something because the incentives are, are large in these acquisitions in terms of um, incentives for the CEO. So is there, is this maybe some form of manipulation? Yeah. Sorry? Um, the graph, no. Are you normalizing? Yeah, I'm just normalizing here. And the, uh, it's an event, an event time. Yes. For the conference call, you only look at what the CEO says, or you know, if the CFO has a separate but related mm. call, you're looking at that too? Or yeah, we can. Does it make a difference? Or is it all we have, well, <laughs> probably they're similar, but we haven't we haven't looked at the differences yet. But we can we can extract we can, we can extract CEO, CFO, and whoever else. I mean, the, so um, essentially, yeah. So this is. associated with certain types of, so say you've got a guy who's going to stay at this company forever, yeah. then he has an incentive not to lie. Um, I'm wondering whether tenure, age, time for retirement, something yeah. like that actually matters. Uh, yeah, we haven't looked into this, but I'm pretty sure it does matter. So there's other work that looks at, um, that essentially um, distinguishes overconfident CEOs from other CEOs using some measure of um, how long they hold their stock options. Yeah, whether, stock options. yeah. And, and they find that overconfidence CEOs, so mergers of overconfidence CEOs are worse for shareholders than others. So that, there's that. So we haven't, um, this is something we should definitely look into. Because the incentives here are very different. So if you compare this to quarterly earnings guidance, so if you are too optimistic providing earnings guidance, then next, um, for next quarter, the market can adjust your bias, right? So they will essentially not believe you. In a merger context, especially these large, if it's large mergers, then maybe the incentives are, are much higher. Than, um, well, you, should, you have an incentive to invest in a credible reputation when you take over, do a really big deal, and then within a year, bugger off and keep the merger. We can have a look at that. So that's definitely good. So essentially, this is the area that um, we're working on is trying to um, see whether, in a world where there are processing costs and or behavioral biases, whether um, these, uh, these afford essentially management to, to um, disclose strategically and, and influence market behavior, and um, especially because the, the incentives are not always aligned. And so far, the literature has focused on quantitative on numbers or earnings management, there's a big literature, but more and more there's um, emerging literature on kind of using the text and trying to analyze what is in the narratives of the disclosure. And to close, just uh, 
show you this ad from the, I think it's from the 80s or 70s. <laughs> this is when accounting was still cool. Accountancy was my life until I discovered Smirnoff. I haven't discovered Smirnoff yet, so. <laughs> All right, any questions? Good. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.